So you look at some of the research and you talk to clients about this, you talk to patients and you say things like, hey, grip strength can be an indicator of your life expectancy, yeah. right? Your mortality, and you're like, how is that even possible? Right. right? And you say, well, it, it's, it's translative, right? Into other, like you said, strength, and your strength affects your blood sugar, and it affects, you know, a, a number of other systems in the body. You said gut health. Yeah. That's one of the five big ones, right? right? So you look at, you know, what you're doing with your enteric system. Mm -hmm. And from a Chinese medical perspective, I look at this as really bridging the gap, right? You say grip strength, what's it correlated to low chi? Does chi mean electrical energy coming through, you know, coming through the, the skeletal muscle? Mm -hmm. Not really, no. The concept of chi was originally converted from French to, from Chinese to French to English. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the French converted it and they had a loose translation. So what most of the Western world took as chi was electricity, mm -hmm. right? But it wasn't actually that. It was the process of taking air and converting that to energy. Hmm. So, right, so what you end up having there is this concept of that sounds a lot like the way that we process things through the lungs and move ATP mm -hmm. and we have to feed mitochondria. Yeah. Okay, so now we're starting to talk things in biomedical terms. We're not, we're not saying something different, we're saying the same, but now we're just starting to understand what they may have meant by this, mm -hmm. right? And so we have to do a better job of coding this. For example, the, the interstitial organ that we have now labeled, right? It's the biggest organ in the body, 20% of these interstitial space. It's new. No, it's not. No, it's, it's been there. We just discovered it. We rediscovered it. The Chinese uh, actually wrote about that in the Han Dynasty, which is about 2,000 years ago. And they called it the San Zhao Channel. But this is fascinating because this is exact type of cases that we have to do a better job of evaluating so we can translate it to what's happening in the future. So if I look at this and say, 2,000 years ago, the Chinese and the Han Dynasty started vivisecting human uh, political prisoners, right? Kind of a gruesome thing, yeah. but they saw the organ. They documented it and they said, that's the San Zhao. That is the passage of water and heat in the body in the interstitial space. I'm Mike. Mike. Yeah. Pleasure to see you. Yeah. Thanks for having us out. And all Absolutely. Stuff. Are you good? Glitch free. Oh. Glitch free. Well, give it a Kind of. Can I help you? Good. Yeah. You've I've been sitting system? for like three days. I need to move, <laughs> carry stuff. You want me to carry that water? Is it going to. I got it strapped in. Oh, All right. We should be good. Keep an eye on that. I've done this before. I showed him your picture. Oh, it's before and after? Congrats. Yeah. Thanks, man. That was over the summer or? Yeah, it was 100 days uh, show July. Mm -hmm. uh, the show was like middle of July. Yeah, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Yeah, I can imagine. <laughs> Get more for the iPhone? Yeah, it's, it's, I've seen it used on there played with it. That's slick, man. Yeah. You got all kinds of tricks, man. Yeah, you know, he's my buddy, uh, Tab Virtual, I'm the CEO of that company, so he gives me some of that stuff um, to kind of test that. From time to time, but it's really smooth. I mean, any anytime I do like Instagram Live or whatever, I, I like to use that. Yeah, it might, this might be worth a serious investment. Look at this. Oh, yeah. Oh, look at that. All right, I'm going to take some video. Yeah, it's pretty neat, you know? I mean, it's really fun, especially like if you pan or like back away. Yeah, I think it's fun, huh? Oh, do you gotta get one of these for the gym, dude? Yeah. Like, Here, try it. The pretty... Dude, you're gonna love it. Just look at this, dude. It's smooth. Oh, wow. Yeah. For filming uh, fitness oh, and yeah. stuff, like it's... Oh, really... yeah. Somebody likes that. Great. <laughs> So yeah, I'm excited today to catch up with my man Dustin here. We've known each other for a few years now. It's and been a few years. Yeah. yeah. At least, at least what, three, four? Yeah, I think like 2015. Yeah, right there. Yeah. 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 We, had right. a we lifted once. Kind yes. Of kind we invited of, right. me to the gym and yeah. you guys were hitting legs, I think. Though. Yeah, well that was a, that's a, that's, a, um, that's a really good memory actually. Your stuff's working, man. That's yeah. good if you, you got think? that kind of memory. Yeah. Um, I've been watching a lot of the stuff that you're doing too and uh, you know, I know you and then you know, I watch your stuff and I've become even more of a fan, so I'm nice. excited to sit down and like just have a chat. Talk shop. Talk shop. Cool. I think and we're good, yeah? Yeah. Yeah. And you've been lifting and training for how long? Oh, gosh. I started when I was 14. Okay. For sports. Mm -hmm. um, I, you know, funny story, I, yeah. I, I competed uh, in sports most of my life mm -hmm. in through college and then 
grad, first grad school. And it wasn't until I got into Chinese med school that I saw the, the rigors of our hours. We spent 40 hours a week, you know, at the school. Yeah. Uh, not even your studying in clinic time. So I, I just didn't train. Mm -hmm. And I, I fell out of shape and my health got bad. And I, and I remember sitting back because it was a year-round program and there would be two or three weeks, uh, three times a year, so a trimester, where we got time off. And I looked at myself in the mirror on one of those breaks and I went, what the hell happened there, mm -hmm. right? And so I kind of tripped into a run. I started and I just went at it. Um, a year later, I was just finishing uh, Chinese med school. So a year later, when I was free and clear, I competed in the WBFF. Wow. For the first time, cool. And I competed there for a few years, earned a pro status. Mm -hmm. um, you know, got a sponsorship with Optimum Nutrition uh, as a fitness model, um, and got myself back to that kind of state. And I didn't do it for really for a profession. Mm -hmm. I did it because it was a goal that kept me focused. You know, it was the thing that um, this isn't for everyone. You don't have to go to the gym. Yeah. Uh, I know you like to. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it because when I get to the gym, everything else is quiet. Mm -hmm. The rest of the world happens outside the gym for me, and I enjoy that. But that's what's allowed me to stay in shape is you know staying on those goals. But I also recognize from a coaching and practitioner standpoint that not everyone's that way. My my grandfather was unbelievably instrumental in getting me into this world, mm -hmm. into the world of health and fitness, and. That man never stepped foot in a gym in a day in his life, but he played tennis every day. He was an avid uh, beach volleyball player, right? And he walked, and you know that was his way, you know, to live his life from a fitness standpoint. And he passed along some information to me before he passed, and, and he saw me very early ages, 18, 19 years old, working in my first gym, and I was working 12 plus hours a day, which you know for an 18 year old's a lot, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And. I didn't complain once, I did every day, seven days a week, and, and him and my mother were sitting down at the table one night, I came home and he said, think about that, you're working 12 hours a day and you're happy as can be, you should think about that when it comes time to figure out what you're going to do the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And I, I think about that in terms of the world of fitness, and, and this is a, a great takeaway for people watching, is that the world of fitness is controlled and governed by laws, but there are no rules. There are things that we have from a physical world that we have to adhere to. Gravity yeah. exists. Yeah. Okay. But how you attack gravity, there's no rule for it. It's whatever works for you, mm -hmm. right? And jumping and how you try to enhance your ability to jump. It's the same thing with fitness. There's a lot of ways you can do something. There's a few laws that we have. We will adapt to whatever we're doing mm -hmm. and we have to change the stimulus and we have to evaluate what that stimulus is. Now, how you attack that, it's up to you. Yeah. Right? There's no right or wrong. It always depends. And that's something that I think from an evolutionary standpoint, beyond what we're seeing with the integration of the medicines right now that's exciting, is that it seems like the industry is going through an awakening of the answer is it depends. It's less definitive. It's mm -hmm. more, uh, more accepting of different viewpoints, which I think is always good for all of us. Yeah. And that's a cool thing to be a part of right now. And I see that you're very much at the forefront of that, of really getting into, and it's one of the reasons I very much enjoy watching what you do, because you pull people in from these different areas and challenge them to think like, hey, your fitness is affecting your health and your health is affecting your fitness. And how are these different ways that we can attack it? Yeah. It's really doing exactly that, just knocking down those barriers of those preconceived thoughts. Mm -hmm. it's, it's and awesome. customizing it to your, your physique. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. And so I went into, I went into Chinese med school looking at the things that we're talking about, mm -hmm. right? Which is like, you know, how do you use this stuff to get the kind of result you look for in the gym? Yeah. Right? Because the, the Chinese medicine is such a fascinating thing to me. Uh, you know, culturally, you know, culturally we look at it, it's like, oh, it's a, it's a great alternative remedy. It's an alternative healthcare type situation. If everything else fails, you can try this kind of thing. Boom. Yeah. Nailed it. Yeah. And it's like, ah, everything fails. I go see these guys. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. If you go to anybody, right, and say, I've tried all these things and nothing worked. Help me out. The odds of anything working in that situation are very low. Yeah. Right? But there's a few things within the Chinese med. And when I say Chinese medicine, I mean acupuncture. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean herbs. And also moxibustia, cupping, tuina, right? Tai Chi Qi Gong, like those types of energy, uh, energy movement type uh, modalities. Yeah. So it's a combination of really all those things. Um, 
and there's a couple of things within that arena that are become wheelhouses, mm -hmm. right? So one of them you're very familiar with, it, which is acupuncture for pain management, mm -hmm. right? You know, chiropractors and physical therapists and everybody and their brother is using some form of dry needling, wet needling, and with the difference, it's acupuncture. Yeah. Okay. Maybe where you decide to put the needles, how you insert them is a little bit different, but we know that it works very well for pain. There's great efficacy. So boom, let tick that box. Pain yeah. management is awesome. Range of motion, sure. Mm -hmm. It's also great for hormones. And when you think about this, the, the area of modern medicine that kind of takes Chinese medicine and says, okay, we'll bring you in. The first in this culture yeah. is with fertility. Right. Right. Because why? Because we're looking at things and saying, okay, within this cycle, the follicular phase, luteal phases, how do you have to balance the, not only the levels, but the relationships of estrogens, progesterones, those types of things. And between acupuncture and herbs, what you find is a really strong impact on managing very quickly those levels. And, and so you end up with orthopedics and then you end up with hormones. Starting to sound a lot like what we do in our industry, yeah. right? And then the up, the the next big wheelhouse becomes stress management, mm -hmm. right? Calming, right? In, in dropping cortisol levels mm -hmm. and starting to look into hormones. And you know what we say from a Chinese medical perspective of calming the shen, it's really just sedating you or calming the mind. Starting to work through tai chi, qi gong. These are things that people talk about from a meditative standpoint. Sure, right? So what you see is at some level body movement, strength, range of motion, mind, mm -hmm. and then some level of, it's not even spirit, it's more of like this batter, like the hormones that are very difficult for a lot of us to understand. Mm -hmm. And so I go into this Chinese med school with this background in training, with this background in physique transformation and all this therapy, yeah. and think, how do you use these techniques to make it better? And when you go into something with a slant, right, your mind sees things, your eyes see different things because your mind's already thinking them. And I came away from that, that five year experience, right? With this just like completely different perspective of how to support, enhance, optimize hormones, how to optimize movement, how to optimize strength, mm -hmm. really. And that's something that is really starting to revolutionize the way we're looking at our health and fitness. And we're seeing this in our culture in the States by saying things like functional medicine. Yeah. Right. Right. You're, I mean, you're very well versed in that. Exactly. Right? Yeah. What, what types of things are you seeing from a functional medicine standpoint? Uh, when it comes to like fat loss and yeah. performance. Yeah. I mean, everything from, it's really more about uh, gut health, I think is kind of the mm -hmm. big thing in functional medicine right now. Um, but sleep and circadian rhythm balance, I think is like a key, key aspect of it. Um, but what's kind of lacking is like the role that muscle plays in whole body insulin sensitivity, mm -hmm. leptin sensitivity. Mm -hmm. And that's why I'm a huge fan of like a foundation of fitness. And I think fitness is a good baseline. Like if your strength all of a sudden goes down, that's a good barometer that maybe other things in your life are imbalanced or there's more important health issues that need to be addressed. So having that, if you just go on the elliptical for 45 minutes, steady state, you have no baseline. You're like, all right, my perceived exertion is seven. Okay. Well today is like it seems harder, but why would that be? Whereas like if you can squat 225 for 15 reps and then the next day you go in and you can only do eight reps, like right. something's wrong. So that's why I love. Right, because it gives you that great barometer. Yeah. Right, and there's other things you can look at too. It's fascinating because when you look at some of the research and you talk to clients about this, you talk to patients and you say things like, hey, grip strength can be an indicator of your life expectancy, yeah. right? Your mortality and you're like, how is that even possible? Right. Right. You say, well, it, it's, it's translative, right. Into others, like you said, strength and your strength affects your blood sugar and it affects, you know, a, a number of other systems in the body. You said gut health. Yeah. That's one of the five big ones. Right. right. So you look at, you know, what you're doing with your enteric system. Mm -hmm. And from a Chinese medical perspective, I look at this as really bridging the gap between where we are from a fitness perspective. Cause you talk to coaches and they say, how do you analyze someone's digestive system? Right. Yeah. And what do they do? They kind of ask him like, how's your poop? Yeah. Right. I mean, that's, I go once a week. I'm good. No. Yeah. I'm, I'm solid. <laughs> like, Starbucks helps me out with that in the morning. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like I just have that coffee and I'm good to go. So, you, okay. So you look at this and you say, all right, like you asked me a couple of questions about my digestion, mm -hmm. right? You put an extra level diagnostic in there from a Chinese medical perspective. Look at pulse, mm. start to look at the quality of the vessel, start to look at the tongue, yeah. right? It's the root of what's happening from an enteric system standpoint. And our body's giving us these signs all the time. 
and it's expecting us to pick up on the cues, we just don't. Yeah. And probably because no one's ever said anything to us about it. That doesn't mean that we have to shake a dead chicken over our head. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. you can if you want to, mm-hmm. but you don't have to wear a kimono and speak in like the dragon and red bird fly at night. Like mm-hmm. you don't have to speak in those terms. You can simply look at it and go, yeah, your tongue coat may have an effect on and be a sign of what's happening in the rest of your digestive system. And when we see these things, we may want to respond by doing these things. So I, we talk about inflammation yeah. and how that affects blood sugar, how it affects cortisol, your hormones, right? And I think it was 2000, was it 2002? 2002. Mm-hmm. Time Magazine comes out with this big centerpiece, right? And it's like, it's inflammation. Yeah, right? yeah. Was I like, remember the fire, the flame. The, the flame on the yeah. match, right? And it was like, all right, this is going to completely change the way we think about medicine and health now because this is the underlying cause. Yeah. Okay, question. What causes inflammation? Yeah. Because isn't that then the root cause? Like we've been for 15 years on this whole concept of it's inflammation, it's inflammation, it's in, oh you're inflamed. Mm-hmm. Where? Yeah. Why? Right. So if I look at something from the enteric system and say, well my gut's inflamed because I'm eating these foods. Yeah, but why are those foods inflaming your gut? Mm-hmm. Do you have a microbe in there? Is it something you need antimicrobial? Are your gap junctions just not tight? and you're passing food to the blood, to the innate immune system, is that what's happening? Because there's different ways we can look to secure those gap junctions there, sure. and different ways we can, we can look to eradicate those microbes. But that's a n- next level of where we're going with this, you know, this concept. And the fascinating thing to me, standing at the, you know, really the pinnacle of what we're doing from a Chinese med perspective now, mm-hmm. because there's very few people in the Chinese medicine world who pay any attention to real fitness. Right. And people, all kinds of people in the fitness world try to pay attention to Chinese medicine. I'm the only one I know of that went to that school. Yeah. That's why. Right. Because when I'm in, you know, hanging out with our Olympic coaches and our professional coaches and we're bodybuilders and everything else, everyone's like, well, we got this from the Chinese. We got this from the Chinese. Mm-hmm. Great. You did? Because you went to school? You did that? No, no, no. I read it in a book. Yeah. Sure. So let's actually dive in and try to understand this. Right. And what I keep seeing, Mike, is this, that... You know, exactly what happened with inflammation in 2002, mm-hmm. right? We get onto these buzzwords and we get onto this stuff and we say like, well, this is the new revolutionary thing, right? But we forget that it's probably already been identified in some way, shape, or form. So what's the big buzz right now that we've like come up with that's really going to affect like body, movement, muscle, everything? It's this... With the gene stuff, the microbiome project. Yes. You know, it was a human genome project and that was the buzz. Yep. Right, um, and human microbiome project now that you know fats. People are recognizing that fats aren't as bad as we once thought. It's right, carbohydrates. So, yeah, we keep you know talking about different things. Um, but yeah, I don't know that anyone has the 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 one solution that's going to cure all. Right? There's different perspectives, and I think they're all kind of saying the same thing. Um, going back to what you were saying about grip strength. So, mm-hmm. is it fair to say using the vernacular of Chinese medicine? Mm-hmm. Uh, if your grip strength declines, we know that's linked with poor health outcomes, maybe right. early cause mortality. Is that a sign of low chi? It Is can it? be. It or can be. And, and more specifically, just looking at overall uh, overall strength and vitality, yeah. you say that's like the source chi or there's the yuan chi, right? And that may be linked to the kidney or the jing. Mm. And that's also rooted in where our hormones are. The right? adrenals and everything. Yes, yeah. exactly. So you start looking at these corollaries. And what we're finding repeatedly is, you know, we can use any number of examples, mm-hmm. right? You say grip strength, what's it correlated to low chi? Sure. Is it chi, uh, is, does chi mean electrical energy coming through, you know, coming through the, the skeletal muscle? Mm-hmm. Not really. No. Uh, that was, the concept of chi was originally converted from French to, from Chinese to French to English. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the French converted it and they had a loose translation. So what most of the Western world took as chi was electricity, mm. right? But it wasn't actually that. It was the process of taking air and converting that to energy. Hmm. So, right, so what you end up having there is this concept of that sounds a lot like the way that we process things through the lungs and move ATP mm-hmm. and we have to feed mitochondria. Yeah. Okay, so now we're starting to talk things in biomedical terms. We're not, we're not saying something different, we're saying the same, but now we're just starting to understand what they may have meant by this, mm-hmm. right? And so we have to do a better job of coding this. For example, the, the interstitial organ that we have now labeled, right? It's the biggest organ in the body, 20% of these interstitial space. Mm-hmm. It's new. No, it's not. 
No, it's, it's been there. We just discovered it. We rediscovered it. The Chinese uh, actually wrote about that in the Han Dynasty, which is about 2,000 years ago. Wow. And they called it the San Zhao Channel. Now, this is fascinating because this is the exact type of cases that we have to do a better job of evaluating so we can translate it to what's happening in the future. Yeah. So if I look at this and say, 2,000 years ago, the Chinese in the Han Dynasty started vivisecting human uh, political prisoners, mm -hmm. right? Kind of a gruesome thing, yeah. but they saw the organ. They documented it and they said, that's the San Zhao. That is the passage of water and heat in the body in the interstitial space. So if Chinese med practitioners treat this, okay, it's one of the vessels. So uh, New York Magazine writes an article last month and says, is this the key to unlocking Chinese medicine? No, nope, it's the key to unlocking one channel mm -hmm. of the 12 primary, of the 36 overall, right? So you start looking at these things. And my question is, if we start looking at this, Mike, because we see a lot of research and we talk to a lot of people, right. is if we took our efforts and instead of trying to say, you know, does Chinese medicine work, right? Mm -hmm. Like, prove to me it does work. And just went on the assumption that something's working and we actually spent our time asking more interesting questions, like why is it working? Mm -hmm. And what other things that we uncovered in the past that if we actually tried to understand like that interstitial organ, yeah. right, or like inflammation, would that maybe be the key to unlocking some of these metabolic codes for the future? Hmm. And that's more interesting to me and that's where I'm spending most of my time and it's, it's, it's delivering a lot better result and a lot better compliance with clients and patients because they're actually seeing results that are meaningful yeah. that make sense to them, right? And it seems more personalized and individual, right? I mean, you know, for example, um, your favorite Instagram all-star has big arms or whatever, so, yeah. and they say, oh, I love, you know, carnosine, beta alanine, yeah, whatever. Right. So I'm gonna take that, but that may not be their deficiency. They might have other things like a damp spleen. I don't know what right. that means. Whatever, yeah. but, it's, but if you were to work with a practitioner that understands like these channels like you're talking about, right. you can custom tailor it's even better. 100%, so. yeah, you can, you can adjust these things. So if you start looking at uh, where you're coming from, like an ATP production or feeding the mitochondria, right? And you're saying like, all right, I need to create more metabolic energy for this so I can train longer, train harder, these types of things. Yes, I'm absolutely gonna use those precursors in those amino acids. I'm gonna use the, the ATP precursors, right? So my CoQ10, my ALA, my you know, citrulline, my... Um, uh, Current. Car yeah, yeah, exactly. I, th this, is, this is in the enzymatic production of our ATP. Mm -hmm. So we, we have to have that batter there. Yeah. But we also have to look at things that are going to allow us when we put that batter, when we put that mix in, to allow our body to do with it what it needs. Hmm. And so it's not just about taking those building blocks that are there. We're not going to change that. Those building blocks have been determined. We know the essential amino acids, right? We know to this point what we have to use to create true energy, okay? But what we don't know is, like you talked about, like your digestion or my digestion, right? Or anyone's digestion, how we react differently. You know, maybe the way that my my digestive system set up, I could benefit from some more pepsin or some more B6 and intrinsic factors to activate that pepsin. Maybe I need more floral production in certain sections of the digestive tract because you know it's low, and as a result, I have a I have a reduction of neurotransmitter production, and that's causing me problems. My lack of dopamine now is causing me lack of drive in the gym. Mm -hmm. It's not just about cranking me out and putting me on more pre's, <laughs> right? Yeah. Which right. is the answer a lot of times. Lot of and what we're saying is don't just be big billy badass and mm -hmm. go out there and say like, I'm just gonna drive through and push harder. No, 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 even the guys at the top. Mm -hmm. Some of those top bodybuilders that you see, the mass monsters, right, yeah. that are out there, they're not doing things just harder, they're doing things smarter. Mm -hmm. They're getting their micros checked, their macros checked, they're getting their blood checked consistently. They have to, but yeah. you know, they're, they're trying to figure out, like you said, more personalized ways to do this. Mm -hmm. That costs a lot of money. Right? Right. Yeah. But it's more feasible if you have a way to bridge the gap between simply asking someone's question and drawing someone's blood mm -hmm. and give you things like what is your pulse? What is your tongue? Yeah. Right? What are some of the different ways that some of these Chinese techniques that we use within the medicine to say, this is going to give me a different level diagnostic? And, and we can teach these things to patients and, and tell them, hey, when you're experiencing these things, pay attention to it. Your body's telling you something. We're going to use this herbal complex, we're going to use this food is medicine. Yeah, it's yeah. really cool. Yeah. So you can teach people to test their own pulse or that it takes a long time? That takes a bit of time, yeah. but i tell you what you can do. Uh -huh. I mean, and this is something like, again, like I, I'm a, I'm, this is sacrilege as a Chinese med practitioner to say this, but 
you got an iPhone, mm -hmm. right? I mean, not to be brand loyal, but you know, pick the camera up, yeah. put it on your finger with any number of apps that are out there, and it will tell you what your heart rate is. Yeah. Check your resting heart rate in the morning. Yeah. Check your heart rate variability. Mm -hmm. Give me a good idea of what the, where my balance fits between the sympathetic and parasympathetic. Now, the Chinese will look at this too, right? I was reading a case this morning, and it was talking about a consistently inconsistent pulse. Mm. That's heart rate variability. Right. And the signs and symptoms lead to what we consider, you know, there's liver chi, intermittent, it's choppy. Okay, that could be inflammation. It could be tension resulting from psychological or physical stress. So aren't we saying the same thing? Yeah, that's really cool. I mean, HRV has been a huge part of my life, but um, I had no idea it had something to do with like, or it could also be alternatively explained in the terms of Chinese medicine, which is great. The, which, yeah. the reason you don't know that is because no one sat in this seat, and that's my charge right now, is yeah. to sit in that seat and say, we are saying a lot of the same things, and we need to spend our time actually taking this and updating it, mm -hmm. and not trying to get the Western world to speak the language of the ancient Chinese, but rather update what we're talking about from a medical perspective, because we're trained in biomedicine too. Yeah. Put the ego down and actually turn out and say, let's talk about what HRV is, let's mm -hmm. talk about ATP, let's talk about mitochondria, let's talk about hormones, because those are the things that make sense in the minds of the practitioners now, and the patients. I tell you, today's patients are so much further along than oh they were gosh. 10, right? Yeah. The I mean, I, hell, I got clients that I look at, I'm like, I'd have bought, I'd have bought time from you 10 years ago. Yeah. I mean, like, they're so far advanced. <laughs> right. Right? Yeah, this is so true. Podcasts, videos, everything like that. Yeah. People are really knowledgeable. Yeah. Yeah. That's cool. So uh, you have seminars coming up. I mean, how? So what's the next step for for people listening? They're excited. Yep. They're sold on the idea. They like that we can explain things in two different worlds and want to know a little bit more about the world they don't understand. Right. They think it's Chinese medicine. Yeah, we're doing it in two different folds. My passion is really taking this information and making it available to people. So we started a, a seminar series called Project Blueprint, mm -hmm. which is really to look at the blueprint of the body. And we're looking at things in three different capacities. We're talking about it from a body training perspective of how you actually take humans and move them. Right, and move them within the goal of fat loss and muscle development, that kind of thing. We're also doing it from a nutritional standpoint and more along the lines of what you've talked about, mm -hmm. which is trying to understand a little bit more about your biochemical individuality, how those five primary systems, your enteric system, your energy production, uh, what you're doing with your blood sugar, right, mm -hmm. how, how you're sleeping and how you're detoxified and how all those things work together. Mm -hmm. uh, we do individual seminars on, on um, myths and mastery of detoxification process because we've seen both mm -hmm. of us have seen a lot of really misguided detox over Cold the years. flushes and yeah whatever whole else, thing yeah. yeah and i've done a bunch of those yeah right like i mean it's it, it you know i balanced on a swiss ball with the rest of us you know mm -hmm. it's, it's 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 part of how we learn and and then even getting into and this is one of my favorite things is how we use these medicines and these concepts to track menstruation and impact menstruation for fat loss for performance, mm. right? For muscle development, because we're talking hormones. Yeah, and, that's key. And equipping women with those things, and the coaches, because the coaches we talk to have no idea what they're doing with it. Right. And then the, the final component is how we use some of these meridian stimulations to get an immediate change in the range of motion, to get an immediate muscle activation and strength that holds, mm -hmm. right? And, and so within that arena, we're really taking individuals and teaching them how to evaluate someone else's body in meaningful ways and put things in their path. Um, and then we also have a, a program that we use to do that with individual patients. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. And we back that up with what we're doing from a lab analysis standpoint, from mm -hmm. evaluating the blood labs and, um, and trying to match the signs and symptoms that we see from a Chinese perspective with what we're seeing from a Western perspective and truly integrate yeah. with, with people and things that are sustainable for them in their lifestyle. Hmm. That's really cool. Um, so if someone doesn't have access to that, should they seek out? Like, what sort of credentials should they look for? DOM, LAC, like how do you know? You know, what's, what's really, that's a great question. So there is a, um, there's an awakening happening within the world of Chinese medicine right now. And uh, depending, in the, in the United States, depending on the state, um, you have different scopes of practice. So for example, in, in California, we're primary care. Right, and you have different rights when you're in Florida or New Mexico or Rhode Island. Um, in Georgia, I don't even think you can see a doctor as a Chinese med practitioner. I think they they, they put they don't even allow that. Yeah. Uh, but there's a standardization of the education that's happening, and it should. Mm -hmm. um, 
you know, and, and this happened to the chiropractors in the 70s and the physical Indeed, therapists, 100%. Yeah. And so what they're doing is now anyone who graduated before 2015, or at least at, at the school I went to, mm -hmm. has to go through bridge programs to maintain their doctoral standards. Cool. And, uh, and, and, you know, you want to look for people with a, with a DAC, which is Doctorate of Acupuncture, or a D, DACM, which is a Doctorate of Acupuncture in Chinese Medicine. Um, if I'm going to work in the functional med world, and I had a discussion with this about a patient last night, yeah. where we were talking functional medicine, and mm -hmm. I said, you know, you'll, you'll have to forgive me because there's so many people out there saying I'm a functional med practitioner who went to a weekend course. Yeah. And I applaud that. That's fantastic. Mm -hmm. But if I'm going to work within the world of functional medicine, I want that practitioner to have a doctorate in medicine. Yeah. Right. And, and so I work very closely with a medical doctor as well cool. to make sure that we're balancing all those red flags. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's important. Um, and I, I've also had great success in work with naturopaths. Yeah. Right. And I've even had great work and experience with chiropractors. The, the blessing of where we are with a lot of these things, Mike, is that there has never been a time that more information has been available to us right now. We can go on the internet and find things that 20 years ago we didn't you know, oh, yeah. know about, right? And everything you could possibly imagine, you can find almost for free on the internet. But it's intermixed with all this crap mm -hmm. that's out there. So you almost have to have 20 years experience in the industry just to look through it and say, this is probably good, this is probably bad, to be able to decipher between the two, right? right? And so it's, it's difficult because there's more and more practitioners out there. There's more people aware. That's very good. The bad thing is it can be very difficult. I look for MDs. I look for naturopaths. I look for doctorates of acupuncture and Chinese medicine. Mm -hmm. And then I also look for people who've been doing this a while. Yeah. Right? Right. And get, I, I look to you. I look mm -hmm. to colleagues in the industry. I look and get referrals from other practitioners who are doing really good work. Mm -hmm. And I look for governing bodies. So I look for A4M, for example, is great for, you know, for some things in, um, in terms of the, the world of anti-aging and functional medicine, and, and I look for those standards. So um, those are the things that I look for, that I recommend to patients, you know, that they look for. But the beauty of it is, too, is that because of telecommunications, and because you can track a lab and send it somewhere, you can do a lot of diagnostic work at distance yeah. and even coaching and mentoring at distance. I mean, you could work with a great practitioner in Dubai. Yeah. Uh, and if you need one, I can let you know. <laughs> I, got, I, got, I got some good friends. Yeah, if you got, hit the comment bar if you guys need someone in Dubai. So um, David Chifali Johnson, let's get yeah. a plug for that. But cool. it, it's, yeah, it, those are the things you look for. Um, mm -hmm. what are, did I miss any of them? Yeah, I mean, that's good. Institute for Functional Medicine. So they have a certification yes. program. Yeah, and I so, about uh, that one. Yeah, I've been through all their stuff and everything like that. Cool guys. So if folks want to connect with you, Dustin, what's the best way to do that? I've got two websites now. Mm -hmm. So the easiest one is always my name. It's D-U-S-T-E-N Nelson.com. Dustin Nelson.com. Thanks, Mom, for throwing that E in there. <laughs> Making my emails the rest of my life challenging. Yeah. Um, and the second, the project that we're really excited about, mm -hmm. uh, the Project Blueprint, yeah. um, which cool. is just e easy and then always we don't live unless we live on the Instagram, mm -hmm. right? Or the the social media world. So my my uh, social media handles are just my name, Dustin Nelson. Yeah. Easy to find on all formats, and I put a lot of information up there as well. Yeah. yeah. Cool, Dustin. Thanks for coming on, buddy. Yeah, Good to catch up with you. It was awesome. Good fun. to see you. All right, guys. So I'll put those links in the YouTube description below. Follow Dustin over on Instagram. You're really active over there, and uh, I'll put the links to the school and everything like that as well. Oh yeah, awesome. Yeah. I appreciate cool. it. Thanks, Mike. Thanks for tuning in, guys. Thanks, guys.